Good morning. What a special day this is. It is July 28th. Thank you for um, sparing your vacation until after this Sunday, and I, I'm so glad to see you all. So there is an announcements page in your worship folder, and I ask you to turn to that. I would like first to uh, welcome you. This is the First Church in Heartland, and we are here to worship our God. Uh, so thank you. And I'd like to uh, welcome our visitors today, uh, the Hammonds, if you don't know them. Yep, thank you, Bob. Good to see you. And uh, so please make yourselves um, friendly after service. Uh, today is also a special day. We are having fellowship today at the Parsonage. So if you've never seen the Parsonage and you want to take the, the mini tour, let's see the Parsonage. It takes about five minutes. So, <laughs> But um, it's going to be a wonderful time of fellowship. And I hope you're hungry because there is so much food thanks to uh, Michael Collins. And, and uh, we have have labored and with a lot of love to prepare a feast for you. And we are also having a feast of communion today. So if you are seeking God in a deeper way, if you are hungry, if you are seeking healing, then you have come to the right table. So we praise God for that. So I want to thank Joanne Jones and Bill Murphy last week and, um, and Reverend Kelvin for the music. It was so wonderful. Thank you so much. And a big thanks to Pat Carrier and Sarah Holcomb, who provided flowers last week. Thank you, Sarah, for the lovely flowers right out of your garden this morning. Thank you for gracing our communion table. Uh, the, there are many announcements. The August missions effort is dedicated to, dedicated to supporting Heartland School teachers. Now, this church knows we used to do backpacks, and uh, but our missions committee, Diana, talked with the principal at Heartland School, and she said what we really need are, are supplies that the teachers need for um, school year. And so we are collecting gift cards. If you would like to uh, give an offering to that, grab an envelope from the, um, a cash offering, grab an envelope from the Narthex, just write down Heartland School or Mission School offering, something like that. If you're writing a check, just put that in the memo line and we will buy the gift cards and that of course goes on your giving record. You can also buy gift cards yourself and then just hand them to someone in missions, Karen, Diana, uh, or Sarah, or Marilyn Vanti, the four people on missions. And we will see that the Heartland School teachers get those. We're gonna deliver those to the principal and she will distribute them as needed. So thank you so much in advance for your generosity. Uh, the dwelling place will meet on Friday. Uh, you know that our choir is taking a break. Choir rehearsals return on September 18th, and we welcome Rebecca back next week. We're so glad that she and Kevin will be back with us, and we are also looking forward to Pastor Kelvin uh, preaching next week. So please come. I am uh, going to be watching online, um, and because Pastor Kelvin is doing a wonderful series, um, I won't tell you anything yet. We'll post it. But um, it's going to be just a wonderful series, and I'm looking so forward to it. The community luncheon is the second Monday in August. That's August 12th, and it's going to be a fiesta lunch, a wonderful lunch. So please tell your friends, please come at noon. Are there other announcements that I may have missed? Then let us enter in... Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yes, please. Okay, so... Um, so, oh, come on, yeah. So we, we test our water every year, and um, the water in the parish hall, um, we test the raw water, so that's not filtered at all. And the raw water actually failed the test in some areas. Not bacteria, it's not contaminated, but it did fail the test. So we uh, brought in a professional, and um, Rob and I met with that person, and uh, we went through the whole system. Now the system, uh, the initial system is in the bottom of the parsonage, in the basement of the parsonage. That feeds the parish hall and the parsonage. And so um, basically the system needs to be replaced. So. Is it on? Hello? Yeah, okay. I hate to come up here because I always feel like I'm begging for money, but you know, we have a set budget at the beginning of the year and we do have some emergency money and we're going to try to work it out. But the system that's in the parish house feeds the parish hall, and it's over 20 years old, and uh, it's not functioning anymore, basically. Um, and then the 
system that's in the church that we use for the drinking water for all the lunches is only 1.5 gallons and it takes about two hours to get about a gallon of water there you know through the reverse arm osmosis so unfortunately what we're gonna end up doing is putting a 14 gallon tank in the basement underneath the sink take that system because Marilyn doesn't have one in her house put that system in her house and then we have to buy a whole new system so unfortunately we're looking around seven thousand dollars that wasn't planned on this year so uh, we might be coming forward to ask for a vote to take some money. We will be asking for a vote to take some money out from some account once we sit down with Keith and Brett and figure out where it's coming. And if you want to make a donation for that, feel free to. So, okay. um, so I have our first donation um, for this. So, um, yeah, so we'll get a head start on that. We have a $500 donation. Um, so just so you know, we are having um, you know, lunch at the par Parsonage today, and uh, we use bottled water, so please don't worry about that. And um, we also even make our ice from the reverse osmosis system, so we don't use the ice that's from the water. Uh, so I just want you to feel safe about that. And uh, the, the RO system in the parish hall does work. It just takes a long time, as any of us who prepare the luncheons know. We, we get a pitcher of water, we put it in the fridge. We get another pitcher, you know, two hours later, and we put it in the fridge. So um, this system will really allow us to serve more people. Remember when I first got here uh, over six years ago now, um, we served 20, 24 people for lunch. And now we serve 50, 60, sometimes 90 people. So this is a good thing. Yeah, everything. Yeah, men's, the women's are back. You know, we're still really growing so much. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. Yes, Ada May. Yes, yes, the living water. Pray for the living water. Yeah, exactly. And please pray as um, the, you know, we have an update on the um, restroom here and uh, the engineers and the um, both the well people and the septic people have really gotten together and worked so hard. So we know where the septic is going, and it's going to be a great system. It looks like it will not require a pump system because of the pitch, and everything is coming together so nicely. We know where the well is going to be, far away from the street. So please pray for potable water and uh, that everything is coming together under God's true design. Okay, so thank you. Now... Let us enter into a spirit of worship. Amen. Thank you.
stand with me and join in singing Come Thou Almighty King. It is number 27 in your hymnal. Lord, oh, please um, remain standing and join in saying the call to worship. Sorry about that. Lord, our eyes, our hearts, and our minds are focused on you. We have gathered to worship you, and we sing your praises. You are our one true God, and we are your church. We welcome your Holy Spirit in our midst to minister in holiness and to pervade the sacred space. Be glorified in our worship today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So as we prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper and to join in a conversation that uh, appears in your bulletin and we're going to do a special liturgy for pastors and congregations entering into a sabbatical time. So please join me in the prayer of awareness. Holy God, we examine ourselves before you. We lay our hearts open that your light of truth might shine on any area of our lives that does not serve you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would wash us and cleanse us, spirit, soul, and body. Lord, we know that you have equipped us as your church to be ministers of reconciliation. You have given us teachers and pastors to help us learn, to teach us to pray, to deliver your word in power, and to be the church you call us to be. Help us, God, to build our faith, to believe that we are able. 
Help us to stay focused on who we are in you. Protect us from any distraction or onslaught and give us an ever new infilling of your Holy Spirit to keep us in your will and in your ways. Join us together with the mind of Christ and in one accord. We pray in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now I ask Pastor Kelvin to come forward to lead us in the song that we learned last week, Who You Say I Am. And so the words and music are in your bulletin, so please turn to that. Remain seated, but give it your all. Now, as Shirley comes up to read scripture, I want you to turn to the person next to you on your left and say, you are a child of God. Now, turn to the person on your right and say, you are a child of God. You are chosen, not forsaken. There is a place for you. This is, take these words, say these words, post this in your home. You are a child of God. You are chosen, not forsaken. Thank you. The scripture readings today are from Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 7, and 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Find them printed in your, work, in your order of worship. Leviticus 25, 1 through 7. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land will keep a sacred to the Lord. 
For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vines. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I read it because these are the words that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. People should think of us apostles and pastors as servants of Christ, the ones God has trusted with his secrets. Now in this way, those who are trusted with something valuable must show that they are worthy of that trust. As for myself, I do not care if I am judged by you or by any human court. I do not even judge myself. I know of no wrong I have done, but this does not make me right before the Lord. The Lord is the one who judges me. So do not judge before the right time. Wait until the Lord comes. The Lord will bring to light things that are now hidden in darkness, and God will make known the secret purposes of people's hearts. Then God will praise each one of them. Brothers and sisters, I have used Apollos and myself as examples so you could learn through us the meaning of the saying, follow only what is written in the scriptures. Then you will not be mere proud, more proud person of one another. Let me read that again. Then you will not be more proud of one person or leader than another. Who says you are better than others? What do you have that was not given you? And if it was given to you, why do you brag as if you did not receive it as a gift? But it seems to me that God has put us apostles in last place, like those sentenced to die. We are like a show for the whole world to see, angels and people. We are fools for Christ's sake. Some apostles do not have enough to eat or drink or to wear. Some are beaten and have no homes in which to live. We work hard with our own hands for our food. When people curse us, we bless them. When they hurt us, we put up with it. When they tell evil lies about us, we speak nice words about them. Even today, we are not always treated well. I'm not trying to make you feel ashamed. I'm writing this to give you a warning as my own dear children. For though you may have 10,000 teachers in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Through the good news, I became your father in Christ Jesus. So I beg you, please follow my example. That is why I am sending to you Timothy, my son in the Lord. I love Timothy. He is faithful. He will help you remember my way of life in Christ Jesus, just as I teach it in all the churches everywhere. Some of you have become proud, thinking that I will not come again to you. But I will come to you very soon, if the Lord wishes. Then I will know what the church has done, because the kingdom of God is present not in talk, but in power. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Will you pray with me? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord will remain forever. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, church, this is a special Sunday for us. This is the day you get to say, whew, the pastor's gone for a bit. We get a rest. Now, I'm going to tell you, somebody already said that to me. It's true, okay? It's all right, because this person knows me so well. And, uh, <laughs> right, Rob? <laughs> he said, whew, we all get a rest. <laughs> so, all right, admit it. So yes, I am going on sabbatical, a sabbatical that is, it is an extended period of time when the person intentionally does things that are not their normal work. A friend of ours said he's not sure why professors and clergy get sabbaticals. I mean, after all, they don't work any less hard than, you know, than, they don't work any harder than anybody else in a profession, right? 
So I'm not sure where the practice started, and I'm, I'm not sure what the history is, and I'm not sure what it means for us. It's more important that we talk about what it means for us today. So interestingly, when the Lord said to Moses in the scripture that Shirley read, that um, he said, tell the people to take a rest after six years and let the ground go fallow and simply rest. I do feel a little bad for Moses because if you recall, um, Lord said, you know, when they reach the promised land, after six years, take a rest. But Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land. Well, he rested in the Lord before that time. So, uh, and what I mean is he died before he got to the promised land. So I'm hoping I'm not dying before, you know, I get back. But then again, you know, that wouldn't be such a bad thing, okay? Because to live is Christ, to die is gain, you know, all of that. But the scripture that I read uh, is Paul's letter to the church that he established at Corinth. And he had been away and some problems crept into the church. People were forming camps around certain teachers or pastors that had come along. And there were many other problems too. And they were experiencing uh, just, just struggling, really struggling. But Paul was coming back to set things straight and he was also submitting himself to God for God to judge him. And I feel a bit like that, letting God take stock of me, which is good for you, good for me, good for the church. And so just as Paul, he, he was telling this beloved church that no matter who came along, no matter what happened, that no one would love them like he did. And I feel a bit like that too. I, in so many ways, hate the thought of being away from you. I will be gone for 11 Sundays, taking a Sabbath, a sort of rest, and you, as the church, offer me this time of sabbatical. So I do feel there should be some kind of ROI for you. You know, you should have a return on your investment. And I'll explain that letter, what, what the ROI is for you. And this Sabbath is not only for me. The time I spend away is also for the health of the church. And so how is that? Well, besides the fact that you get to hear other voices delivering the word of God in power to you, which is so important, it will confirm for you that the Holy Spirit guides and guards this church, that the Holy Spirit is directing what is taking place here. You will have that trust. Of this, I am quite sure. So, you know, as a single person, I never really took vacations. Um, I didn't really think I needed them. Work was enjoyable for me. Work, everyone said work was my hobby. Even though it meant long, uh, you're, you're laughing because you know it, it's true. Work is my hobby. Well, not for, no, you know, you have a better hobby. You have those daylilies, okay? Um, and honestly, when I first met Michael, I said, you need to get a hobby, you know, remember? Because, you know, <laughs> yeah, I do too. Oh. <laughs> so be it. Um, so work was enjoyable for me, even though it meant long hours, a demanding schedule of research, productivity, meet the deadline, lots of business travel, um, meetings galore, having bosses, being a boss, stress, complicated organizational structures and all of that. I enjoyed work and I made an impact on people around me and on the organizations that I served in. Besides, I learned at a very early age to be a doer. Doing was pretty much everything for me. It defined me. And I epitomized the saying, good, better, best, never let it rest. Make your good better and make your better best. Nothing but your best will do. Now, if you've grown up with that, that's a lot of pressure. Good, better, best, never let it rest. Make your good better, make your better best. Nothing but your best will do. 
That philosophy, if you will, is attributed to St. Jerome. St. Jerome was a priest. He was secretary to the Pope Damascus I. Jerome established a monastery, and he actually translated the Bible into Latin. He was a doer. So frankly, I resisted the idea of taking sabbatical, even though taking sabbatical after five years of service in this church was actually in the contract that I have with this church. Six years ago, when the leadership and I developed that contract, I had no idea I'd even be here that long. Six years ago. But here we are in my seventh year of serving you. While away, I will continue to practice the presence of God, concentrating on God while doing any task. Someone asked me once where and when I prayed the best. Where do you pray? And I said, when I'm ironing. That's when I pray the best. When I'm cleaning, that's when I pray the best. When I'm cooking, that's when I pray the best. It is practicing the presence of God no matter what we're doing. Whether you're gardening, mowing, fixing something, practice the presence of God. It is a spiritual exercise that challenges us to remain focused on God during an everyday task or chore. If you're in the process of healing, if you're going through treatment, practice the presence of God. It will change the nature of your treatment. This practice is associated with Brother Lawrence, a 17th century Carmelite friar and cook who wrote about his experiences with practicing the presence. Lawrence began practicing the presence of God by cultivating a deep presence, a presence of God in his heart, which maintain, was maintained by love rather than by understanding or speech or a fear of judgment. Lawrence often stated that it is God who paints himself on the depths of our souls. Okay, so I will be doing some doing. I intend to rewrite the Hale and Hardy, that, uh, that program with the valuable insights that Shirley and Rob and Juliet provided as they walked that journey for over a year with me. And I'd also like to cull the nuggets from these journals. These are the journals that I have written in my journey with Christ. And maybe there is something in them of value something I need to revisit. And um, amazingly, I haven't journaled for probably 15 years. But these are the journals that speak to the journey and how God corrected, admonished, loved, changed, sanctified me. And so maybe there's something of value. But more than this, I finally got an understanding of what I'm supposed to be doing on sabbatical. God made it clear that that scripture doesn't say, keep doing and know that I am God. No, that scripture 4610, Psalm 4610 says, be still and know that I am God. And so, do you know how hard that is for me? <laughs> do you have any idea? People say to me, why don't you just sit down? I say, why? <laughs> why, when I could be doing something, being somewhere, fixing something? And you, dear church, it is a time for you to be also. It's a time for you to be the church and bring glory to God in the calling that God has called you to. It may be visiting people or serving lunches, offering your gift of music, straightening a doormat, emptying the dishwasher, calling another person to encourage them, making meals, checking in with Megan, because she's going to miss me so much, maybe. <laughs> and a hundred other things that make us the church. Because you are God's church. And just as Paul ended this portion of the letter that I read, I am confident that when I return, quote, I will know what the church has done because the kingdom of God is present not in talk but in power. 
you will have the power of the Holy Spirit to guide and guard you. So now, friends and fellow laborers, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in a short time. And over the past several weeks, these words have been coursing through my mind, ringing in my heart. I've been thinking about this Sunday for a long time. I have longed for and desired and have wanted to eat this meal with you. Our communion is sealed in this supper because all we do and all we are is because of Jesus Christ. He is central and preeminent. Here's the whole passage from Dr. Luke, first, chapter 22. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles were sitting at the table. He said to them, I wanted very much to eat this meal, this Passover supper with you before I suffer. I will not eat another Passover meal until it is given in the true meaning, its true meaning, in the kingdom of God. Then first, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this cup and share it among yourselves. I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until God's kingdom comes. Then Jesus took some bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the apostles, saying, This is my body which I am giving for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This is the cup. This cup is the new agreement that God makes with his people. This new agreement begins with my blood, which is poured out for you. So let us prepare. Let us prepare our hearts let us join in one accord as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But before we do that, we are going to go through this. It's a yellow sheet in your folder. And uh, it asks Rob to come forward and uh, guide us in this. So this is our commitment, our conversation, and our commitment that we make before we share the meal that seals our relationship with Jesus and with one another. Yeah, it's on. So we join all. On the seventh day, God rested and celebrated all of creation. God surveyed all that God had made and said, it is good.
So dear friends, co-laborers with me and with Christ, thank you for creating this Sabbath opportunity. Thank you for allowing God to speak through other voices while I'm away. I leave with full confidence in the ministers who will preach, in you as the leadership who will serve, pray, and with God's help, carry on the example of Christ's ministry that is the hallmark of the First Church in Heartland. I will miss you, but I will be here in spirit. Now, I'd like to take the opportunity to anoint our leadership, um, all of the, the heads of missions, trustees, um, our treasurer, if he's here, surely you'll stand in for Keith, if you don't mind, and Megan. So, um, and if anybody else feels that they need an anointing to go forward and do what God is calling them to do, please come up. It's not going to be long, but... these words from the Apostle Paul to Christ's people in Corinth. Finally, brothers and sisters, I implore you, keep rejoicing, keep your spirits up and be cheerful, repair whatever is broken, encourage each other, think as one, in harmony, and live at peace. Do all that, and God, the author of love and peace, will remain with you. May the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus, the anointed, the extravagant love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with you. Amen. Let us join together. You shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. God below you, God before you, God behind you, God everywhere you turn, and God within you. Amen. Will you stand with me and sing together the hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. It is number 558 in the hymnal.
There is a prayer list in your bulletin, so please turn to that. We have many, many people to pray for. And please take this prayer list with you as, you know, we could spend the next couple of hours praying here, but um, lay your hands on it. Mention each name before the Lord at some point in your day and allow the Holy Spirit of God to minister to those who need a touch from a sovereign God who is greater than any circumstance. So we pray for every branch of our government to act with wisdom and in truth that the upcoming election will be in God's hands and that fear will not have a hold on the people of this country in the name of Jesus. We pray for Haley Marilyn Vanti's niece to have confidence to pass the law bar. I gave her my, what I call my, um, my student scripture, that the Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance. I, I thought about it uh, through a lot of exams and other things, that, other tests. The Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance. Now that means it's, you know, the things of God, but I think we can apply it to the things of the world, whatever she needs. So we pray for Haley. We pray for these Granby, this Granby family who lost their home to a fire, and we were so grateful uh, to the people who have donated things, especially Sue Adams, who has donated so many things for kids. So we provided fun packs for their four-year-old twin boys, big packs that had books and activities and all kinds of toys and stuffed animals and everything for their boys. Um, please pray that they will find restoration in the name of Jesus. We pray for Shannon, who was diagnosed with ALS. We pray for her husband, Joel, and their four-year-old twins, boy and a girl, who also got fun packs from this church. So again, we're very grateful to help a family in need. Um, Shannon is already in a wheelchair, even though she was just diagnosed, so please pray. She's a young mother. Um, pray for that family to, to know Christ in a way that will take them through this journey. We pray for Karen McNulty, who has, um, she had another, she had two knee replacements, and one of them is infected again. Uh, she had an infection in the other one where the joint literally has to be removed and she needs to be um, in a facility for six weeks without a joint in her knee so that that infection can heal. So please pray for Karen. Pray. We pray, oh God, for you to touch her just with the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Touch her mortal body from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Strengthen her immune system. Give the doctors wisdom and understanding and discernment to know exactly what will fight this infection and stave it off forever. Give her strength for the journey. We pray for Bob, who is also struggling with some health issues. We ask that you draw this family ever closer to you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We pray for Michael Gowan, who um, has been assessed at Duke, and um, he is being treated now for esophageal cancer. Uh, we pray for Terry, Ada May's daughter, to find work, and for this family in Lenore, uh, Carolinas, to, for their family to thrive, for somehow, for God to provide in miraculous ways. We pray for Bill Murphy's uh, brother-in-law's family, Morris Smith, who passed away. Uh, Bill's family has really been rocked with, um, with deaths, and so we pray that that, too, that family will experience grief in a different way, that they will know that God is glorified in the lives of the people who have gone before. We celebrate joys for all the anniversaries, 28 years for, pa for Pat and Douglas, 28 years. Congratulations. Yeah, happy anniversary. Um, we pray for all of those who are celebrating birthdays and milestones. We pray for Joni Wayman. She's been struggling, and we really are praying for stabilized health. Um, Marilyn and I have talked about this, and you know, it's probably never going to sort of completely resolve, but she needs strength for this journey, just stabilized and strength for this journey. 
We travel for all, we pray for all of those who are traveling. Um, Borny Thompson's in Norway. Uh, we know that Kevin and Rebecca are back, and so we're glad that they have safely returned. We pray for all of those who will be away, and I thank you for your prayers for me while I'm away. Uh, and for Michael and I, when we, we are going to be traveling to Italy for two weeks, so please pray. That's um, the last two weeks of August. Um, and the church will know where I am when I'm away away, when I'm sort of away, and so, um, so you, you know to always get a hold of Rob and Megan, and they will find the pastor who is in charge of handling pastoral emergencies while I'm away. We pray for, uh, for Joanne Rosinski to overcome. She's here with us today, and uh, we're going to celebrate communion together, and we are going to walk this journey with Joanne. And we welcome her, niece, her uh, sister, Heather, and we thank you that you're here and that we can minister to you love and grace. We will, as, as we hug you, we will impart strength to you, strength for the journey, that your doctors will know exactly what to do, that you will continue to get good news, that your body will rise up, live, and give glory to the God Almighty who created you, who gave you purpose, who loves you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We pray for Vinnie Donovan, who's going to have open heart surgery. Um, I'll find out more today if uh, that's taking place tomorrow. We're still waiting to see Shane walk in with Ada May, who um, we are praying for his release in so many ways. He has found the Lord Jesus Christ. He has a deep relationship with God, and now we ask that God would show himself mighty on Shane's behalf by setting him free. We pray for uh, Sally, Jim, and Tommy and their needs. We bring those before the Lord. We continue to pray for Mary Sue, Kelvin Jones' sister, for grace with the journey that she is traveling with cancer. And we pray that, uh, that the, that journey will be filled with grace, with peace, with great compassion. We thank you, oh God. We pray for all of those here, for Jerry, for Betty, for especially for those, Matt and Ryan, who are struggling with trying to get free from addiction, that the Holy Spirit power, a delivering power, a redeeming power would come into their lives, that they would be open to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to set them free, free, truly free, in the name of Jesus. We pray for all of those who are caring for others, especially we pray for Bob Forsyth who fell and he really hurt himself, and, but he's been so tender in caring for, for Sue. We do pray for them. And uh, we pray uh, Bob is going to be taking some respite and Sue is going to, on uh, August 10th, Sue will be going to Meadowbrook uh, to rest there while Bob has a brief respite of time at the Cape with family. So please pray for them. Uh, Sue will do wonderfully at Meadowbrook. She's so, uh, she's very, she's very easy to care for and to be with. And Bob needs a real deep rest. So please pray for them. We pray for all of those who are ministering to Bill and Barbara Watson. We pray for Karen and Margie and Brett and Bill and Deborah and um, Matt and Douglas, we pray for all of them in the name of Jesus that strength for the journey would be yours and that peace and grace would be for your parents in the name of Jesus. We pray for all those on our prayer list, all the names, Lord, we bring them before you. Are there others now that we may pray for? Holy One, you say to come to you that you always hear our prayer. And so with great confidence, Lord, we humbly but confidently approach the throne of grace to receive your grace and mercy in a time of need. We come because you are sovereign, because you are Lord of all, because you are the one who was and is and is to come. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You know the end from the beginning. 
And so we can place our trust in you. As we lift our hands, as we lift our eyes off of our circumstances, we give you thanks. Thanks for the many blessings. We forget not all your benefits. You have healed all of our disease. You have crowned us with righteousness and loving kindness. You have redeemed us from the curse. You have set our feet on a rock, the rock of Jesus Christ. So the river will not overflow us. The fire will not burn us. You will be with us forever. Thank you, O oh God. We pray now in the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So now, friends, we prepare our hearts for communion. And before we receive, we're going to sing this song. It's called, Lord, We Need Bread. It is an insert in your bulletin. So as you know, in our church, we take communion by intention. We take the bread, dip it into the cup. And as you remember the words that, that we read from Luke, how Jesus so longed to have this Passover supper with his friends, knowing that he was going to suffer, I want you to remember that God did all of that for you. Sent Jesus, allowed Jesus to suffer, take all of our sin, all sin for all time, for all people, that we might live free, giving glory to God. So as you come forward, we start at the back, come forward, you place your offering in the offering plate, you're coming to the altar of God. Bring whatever you have. Bring your heart, bring your cares, bring your thoughts, your thanksgiving, bring it all and lay it at the altar that you might go lighter back into the world, free. So on that night that Jesus knew that he would be betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body that I am giving for you. Take it and eat. As you do, you remember me. And after supper, he took the cup, the second cup, welcoming them and said, This is the cup of the new covenant given in my blood. It is the cup of the new covenant for forgiveness of sin, all sin for all people, 
for all time. Take and drink, all of you, for all things are prepared. We wait for Jesus to come back, to drink again and sup with us in the kingdom of God's fulfillment. All things are prepared, come. There is gluten-free bread in the center. It hasn't touched the other bread, so if you are gluten-free, please take it from the center cup. Thank you. Let's uh, serve, serve Joanne and Louise first.
please join me in the prayer of dedication? You give us so much, and we do not take any of your benefits for granted. Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases, who redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion, who satisfies my desires with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. I believe your word, Lord, and I receive all that you have for me. Now I give my gifts to you in great measure because of your faithfulness and your generous spirit. Receive my offering today with all my heart. Amen. Dear Church, you are equipped, you've been called, and you are prepared to lead this congregation to join together in power and authority given to you by the Holy Spirit through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ through his resurrection. Like we have said on those little grace cards, we are going forward in resurrection power, alive in communion with Christ, eternally secure in God. May you know it all the days of your lives. I bless you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> This is the day.